I couldn't sleep. I was miserable. I had eczema all over my body. Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous form of heartburn in your esophagus. I studied what I'm about to give for seven years. So let me set this up. Seven years, full time for the National Science Foundation. And I did it for free. Here's my take on the carnivore diet. The only thing that helps is if I take in a leave. I work with clients to get them off of those things. One thing you could try doing, and if you're taking the leave, maybe start doing these other things that I'm about to tell you about. Invest your best ROI that you can possibly make and get the best return on is investing in your, your most important physical asset, which is your body. You should stay in the victim mentality I gotta stand and fight for my honor and my family That's how I did it, cause you know that's how it had to be So now I'm slaying dragons and I do it happily I told them I refuse to be another casualty I looked inside the dragon's eyes and then I told them casually Hi, I'm a dragon slayer and I got a dragon lair I'ma go and slay a dragon then I'm gonna drag it there I don't care, I ain't scared Look inside my heart and there's a line there Conquering my dragons, I ain't fighting fair Meet Dr. Sean O'Mara, a trailblazer in health and performance optimization, whose mission is to revolutionize your well-being. As a founder of the innovative medical startup Lantu in Minneapolis, Dr. O'Mara's groundbreaking work earned him a National Science Foundation grant to combat chronic diseases through advanced data analytics, exploring the human genome and microbiome. With over a decade of experience, Dr. O'Mara has mastered the art of reversing chronic conditions without the use of pharmaceuticals or surgeries, focusing instead on enhancing your appearance, performance, and life quality. His distinguished career includes serving U.S. presidents, vice presidents, and secretaries of state, earning him the title of Outstanding Physician in the U.S. Army. Whether you're a business executive, a professional athlete, or seeking to uplift your health, Dr. O'Mara's expertise promises unparalleled optimization. First of all, doctor, I got to tell you, it is great to be with you. And, you know, it's always interesting when I meet somebody and I want to refer to them as doctor because they hold such a high level of um, respect and education and they've earned that at the highest level. But then when I meet somebody like you and they say, just call me Sean, that actually is like one of those things that says, okay, great. I've got this person that's highly educated with this great background and your background is fantastic. Uh, and yet uh, they're, 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 they're humble about what they do. But I'm going to refer to you as doctor on the program because that's really what we're talking about here. And that's, uh, that's what needs to take place. Um, I, I wouldn't mind if you wouldn't, if you could just go into a brief amount of your history that wouldn't have been in your formal introduction, you think that is relevant for how you got to where you are right now and why we're talking to so that'd be great. Sure. So, you know, like many people, you know, I've lived lives where there's been good times and bad times. So not part of my biography is the fact that I had a bad childhood. And uh, it was really wasn't until uh, I was in my 50s, probably about 55, that I had insights why my childhood was so bad. I knew it was bad, but really it was the product of a father who served his country at the age of 15, stepped forward and entered the military in World War II. So he's on a ship at the age of 16 with uh, kamikaze pilots coming in and he just had PTSD. I didn't know that he had PTSD. I just thought, you know, hey, we're a screwed up family. But what happened was uh, I was a kid, you know, a youngster and I, I really a toddler. And I never asked my father for help. I was terrified of my father because of his PTSD and his anger and things like that. But, you know, um, just things turned out that I figured out from a young age how to solve problems. I didn't have a dad to go to. So rather than falling apart in my life, I just learned on my own from a very early age how to troubleshoot and how to make things better. And I think that in a, uh, in, in, is an interesting aspect to my life because uh, it's given me my bend today, which is I just love to fix things and improve things. And so when I became a physician after doing all these other things, uh, it became natural for me to fix human bodies. But I didn't just, I didn't want to, I was less attracted to making money off those bodies and more interested in really just making them better. So that's an interesting aspect to my background. It isn't part of my biography, but at times I like to share it and I think it's positive. And the other thing about, you know, my name and why I just go by Sean to people is that, look, 
at our fundamental levels, we are just fellow human beings in this journey of life. And yeah. I don't want to impair my capacity to relate to my fellow man uh, who's in front of me uh, by adopting a title of doctor. I'm just another human being and I want to interact with that person to try to help them become uh, the best version, biological version of themselves that that I could possibly do to have that kind of interaction. And so I don't need the title of Sean to do that. And I find that gets uh, or Dr. Sean to get uh, to, to do that. I could get in the way. I need to relate to that person as just another human being. And yes, I am a physician and I do use Dr. Sean just as kind of a marketing thing on social media, but it's to try to reach one person and save their life or improve their life that use that title. But thereafter, when I'm just working one-on-one with people, uh, interacting with them, it's just Sean. Did you know that Leading Giants has over 120 micro-learning modules from four to 19 minutes on entrepreneurship, communication, anything to maximize your influence? We are here to help you build the life of your dreams by maximizing your influence, growing a company, leading people at levels you've never led before. If you're in sales, having a greater opportunity for increased closing percentages and larger activity than you've ever had before. It's time now for you to jump in and join Leading Giants. All you have to do is press that button right down there. In order to access this, share with your friends, become a giant. We'll go slay some dragons. These are not unrelated. When you give your story, there's a lot of people who have had horrible childhoods and because of that, they now enter into a place of victimhood, which I think anybody who has compassion can kind of understand, but at the same doesn't serve them. And so when you look at it though, here's a really interesting thing. Many people who've gone through a difficult time like that have been way more effective in life than others because they ended up gaining something from that circumstance that they, that, that just built them who they are. And when you look back on it, you say, okay, well, I can actually, Thank God for this circumstance because it made me who I am today is a a fascinating thing. So, okay, we're talking about everything by way of health. And I think this is going to kind of blow the audience's mind with some of the things that you talk about because they're really not mainstream, but they're so obvious once you point them out. And so, so there's fringe ideas from doctors that are not mainstream where you go, that just seems weird. This doesn't. Every single thing about it goes, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. And... Um, just separate, this is an interesting thing. I am, I've never been an extreme diet person. In fact, on my materials through the years, you'll hear me kind of making fun of it. And I'll be like, listen, you know what? Most people are sitting there watching TV, trying to figure out how to get healthy. And they're buying this machine and that machine and that juice and this formula. They really know what they need to do. First of all, turn the TV off and start moving. Okay. One, two, you know, eat reasonable, just eat reasonable. Don't go extreme on things. But I actually went extreme on something for the first time ever. And this will kind of come out more in the relationship that we're pursuing here together, as I'm interested. I was a fighter for 20 some years. I've always been in good shape. Generally speaking, people always say, well, you you know, and I, this is only relevant because of the show. Otherwise, I won't be talking about it because it'd be boring to people and it's boring to me. But generally, people say, you know, oh, I thought you were younger than you actually are. And, um, and that I'm in relatively good shape. And uh, so I didn't need to go to a diet or anything because of that. But I was a fighter for 20 some years and I beat up my joints big time. And my shoulder, my, my ortho did a scan on it. He said, you have the shoulder of an 85 year old. And, and he said, but your hip is even older than 85. And the pain has been increasing and increasing. And I went to the doctor about three weeks ago and I said, I, I got to get my hip replaced because it just hurts so bad. I can hardly stand it. And I've gone through bad surgeries, and so I'm hesitant to do surgeries. And he said, you know, I said, should I or shouldn't I? I'm only 54. He said, you're kind of in between. And I, I said, uh, well, then if I just rehab it like you wouldn't believe and, and change my diet, is there a way that I can postpone this? And he goes, yeah. And I said, can I hurt it by doing that? And he goes, well, you can't hurt it, but you can definitely, you're going to be hurt. And I was like, well, okay, if I can endure the pain, that's fine. The long and the short of it is I started doing, and we talked about this before we get it again, something called perfect walking, which is basically to walk a certain, uh, you know, number of minutes a day in perfect, perfect stride to make up for anything that I did that was overcompensating to, to throw off. But then I did the, I started the carnivore diet and I did that a month ago. I, anybody who knows me well would go, Duran's doing a carnivore. I never do anything like that. And, um, 
and I have reduced inflammation, reduced pain at such a huge level. Then we spoke a few weeks ago, and you said you need to add fermented uh, foods to that. Started doing that, and there's some some other aspects and benefits that I've I've started to notice. But here's I'm going to read this text to you, and I feel I feel so much like a, a Dr. Jordan Peterson ripoff by reading this. You have no idea <laughs> because I have six kids. Okay, my daughter. Um, has been suffering so bad. She's a nurse, okay, and she's got a young child. She's been suffering so bad with back pain that she's she's been at an 8 out of 10, constantly in pain. She's always crying. It's affecting everything about her mood. Uh, she's never been victimized, always optimistic, but she sounds nihilistic on the idea of being able to heal. And, like, there's just nothing that is, is going to work for me. And I said, you really, I'm, I don't know, this sounds crazy, but try the carnivore diet. And I'm, I'm not an evangelist for it because I'm just starting it myself. I'm just like, you got to try something. I get this text from her, literally, uh, what is it? Well, now, now 30 minutes before we started talking and it says this, when I started my carnivore pain, when I started carnivore, my pain was eight to 10, usually all the time, especially at night and sitting. Now it's like a two. I'm not working and um, I'm doing that program. In other words, she took a little bit of time off for her back too. So there would be a physical element to this. Okay. But nothing has made my pain consistently go away like this has. I said, wow, that's awesome. I actually have a meeting with a specialist on this today. And she says, I haven't felt this normal in almost a year. I can sit in the car and not want to cry. I'm so grateful. Officially day 15 today too. Are you meeting with that Sean Omara guy. That's what she asks me. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I said, yes, it's him. And I said, I'll mention this if it's okay. And she said, yes, please do. So that's significant. So I want you to kind of get into what it is that's a, a shift and a change and how it's related to maybe some dietary things like I talked about. But I also want to do this, uh, Dr. Sean. You are, in fact, really good at motivating people for change. But there's a certain percentage of people, and my audience, too, is very much just entrepreneurs, business leaders, executives. So they understand how to make business decisions according to data, and if it's got to be done, we do it. But in leading people and leading ourselves, there are some people who like cake more than they want their health. They like television more than they like working out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the things that can make changes there. I want to talk about some of those things in a diet where a person doesn't have to hate everything they're eating, that they can actually literally enjoy this life and how they can get that into a certain place and what those overall benefits are. But why don't you explain a little bit about how what you do is different and why it is that my daughter might be experiencing the effects that she's experiencing and why why I'm experiencing the, the things that I'm experiencing, and I want to get them to be way better than they are right now, but I'm definitely noticing improvement. Hey there, Giant. Dave Duran here, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our brand new e-newsletter where you will get the best of the best tips and insights to unlock the giant in you, build an empire, and slay some dragons. Sign up below. Let's go slay some dragons. Sure. So um, before I do that, what I thought, though, would be helpful, and particularly in light of uh, your daughter's uh, text, is to to uh, to explain why I did those things and how and it as part of what, how I was able to make this change. So, you know, we'll back up. To, I'm 60 years of age, about to turn 61 today, and uh, at around the age of 48, uh, I met um, uh, a patient that was working out in our hospital's wellness center, this big fancy gym. And at that time, I was clearly a middle-aged guy. I had a big gut. I was gaining weight, and I was suffering from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I had clogged arteries. Uh, I had shortness of breath. Uh, I had erectile dysfunction. I had an enlarged prostate um, that that confined, constrained my urination to a dribble outside of my body. It was just, it was like one of these flowing little tiny fountains. Uh, there was no strain. There was no shooting of my urine. Uh, at nighttime, I was waking up five times at night to pee. Uh, I couldn't sleep. I was miserable. Um, I had athersc- or, uh, uh, eczema all over my body, Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous form of heartburn in your esophagus where I had these precancerous lesions 
that were so bad. I was on three prescription drugs to try to stop my heartburn. I had to have a scoping procedure every three months for them to biopsy my precancerous lesions just to wait for when they actually transition to cancer and I need would need radiation or chemotherapy or you know, some other form of cancer therapy. I mean, just imagine the stress of every three months having to have that. And I had it so often, uh, T, that I wouldn't even use a sedation, a sedative. I'd be wide awake when they put this gigantic hose down my throat because I was a full-time physician. And I was also in the military and um, I I worked part-time jobs trying to care for my five kids. So I couldn't afford a whole day of recovery from anesthesia I just wake up and start seeing patients. So, um, and I also uh, had degenerative joint disease, chronic back pain. I'll just go so far as to say 80% of the country at some point will go to an emergency room for back pain. It's that prevalent of a disease. And I had, in my opinion, the worst back of anybody that I knew of. My back pain started actually uh, when I, I had a fight with my identical twin brother, physical fight. And uh, hurt my back and had uh, had a displaced disc at the age of 12. And so I was plagued with back pain for my entire adult life until uh, I actually hit 50. And uh, the way, you know, so uh, and I, I've been hospitalized for back pain. I had collapsed lungs because my back hurt so much. I could only shallow breathe like this little tiny breast because it hurt that much. For days, and my lungs collapsed at one time, and and then I threw my back out once from a sneeze, and so for years, probably five years of my life, I never sneezed. You ever hear of a human never sneezing? Here's no. And by the way, you know when you have back pain, and and somebody says, "What happened?" You want to say, "Well, I was wrestling an alligator, or you know, <laughs> I was in a street fight," and you got to say it's a sneeze. I mean, yeah, I've, I've had injuries like that too. Yeah, well, it was he won. One of my flares, several, some of my flares were from sneezing. And so um, the sneezes would bring terror to me. You know, the thought I'm going to be laid up for three days and on my back in bed. And I won't be able to do anything. I'll have to take off and work. And so the fear that would beset me was so terrifying. It was like gunfire and it would abort the sneeze. You know, like, and as soon as this terror would hit in, I it would stop the sneeze. I would see. So for five years... This dude never sneezed. That wow. is bad back pain. Okay. This is that is gross. It'd be with bad pathology. Today, I got none. Every back doctor, specialist in the world says, you will live with this for the rest of your life. I said, no, that's not going to happen. I, I think I'm curing myself. And now I haven't had a single episode of back pain in eight years. Not one. And I remember staying in front of this one guy who was uh, in this business organization I was in called the Goddess. And he was afflicted with back pain, and I just took care of him for free, told him what he had to do, and he dismissed it. He, because I gave it to him for free, he, I remember looking at him, and he's like, this is a free food, a free buffet, and it tasted free, so he didn't do that. So mm. if, if you value what I'm about to give you, if you really understand the value, what we're going to explain to to you on Dur- Dur- uh, Duran on Demand here, uh, and you put it in application You'll you'll turn your disease process around, your chronic disease. And um, I studied what I'm about to give for seven years. So let me set this up. Seven years full time for the National Science Foundation. I'd get up four o'clock in the morning. I'd work till usually after seven o'clock at night. And uh, I just all day long studied this and I did it for free for charity, for our country for our species. I never took a penny. And then I worked part-time in an urgent care to try to provide for my family. So uh, if that isn't, you know, uh, enough for, you know, the, that I'm here talking about, it, understand that my motivation was incredibly noble to help out our species. And as a result, the things that I learned is what I'm going to share with your, your audience today was all derived, not for profit. I'm just uh, just developed to help out our species. And uh, I want to ultimately give it away. I'm in the process of writing books and stuff, but I need a loyal following. I need some influencers. And I think you and your audience, they can model this and start influencing other people. And that's what I want to do. I want to slay 
slay the giant of chronic disease. And every one of my medical problems went completely away. Every one of them went away from um, just initially a dietary change, eating eating more healthy, and then these other strategies that we later learned through the National Science Foundation on how to live. No drugs, no surgeries, no procedures. It's basically, in my opinion, how our ancestors would have lived hundreds of thousands of years ago. And as a result of better living, uh, they had better health. You know, it's, it's interesting to, because there are some things here. Again, I've never been extreme on this, but I've always been the type of person who believed that nutrition mattered and exercise mattered. It can heal most things. I was told maybe 15 years ago I needed to have my knees replaced. And I can understand why, because I had a couple of surgeries and I, I would play a sport like tennis or pickleball or basketball, and I could do it for 30 minutes. And then for three days, I would have to rest. And I, again, got a little more serious about my, my diet. And I did this thing called knees over toes. He's also kind of a, a you know, a, uh, a influencer kind of guy in line. And I was like, I was just desperate for anything. I'm telling you, my knee pain is gone entirely. And the, my point of this is that that there are things we can do outside of 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 medicine. Well, I, this is actually medicine. I don't know why people don't call it medicine. Nutrition and fitness is it, it, that, that there are medical benefits to all of this. But because it's natural, I think there's some hesitations. And, you know, it, it would be easy to get into, you know, the reasons why. And we're not going to do this in the show, but it's a totally separate show. The reasons why people don't want this information out there. And there are very powerful reasons for that. And I am not a conspiracy theorist. One of the reasons I'm not a conspiracy theorist is I don't believe that you can have more than two people that are able, able to, to tell secrets. Uh, but I think that there's just some like very, very big financial powers that get in the way of some of this information because it would radically change our entire financial landscape as a, as a country. So, OK, let's dive into this. Um, you know, with, with the beginning, somebody has all these challenges and ailments that you have, the things that most of us have, most people kind of succumb to them. They say, this is my lot in life. It cannot change, or it's too late for me. You've obviously seen there's a difference. What is the process that they go through? And, um, and maybe we can kind of lead with a little bit of the end and then go in between just a, just a taste of this. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to change their diet a little bit. Let's just go two sentences on that. And then we'll hit that deeper later on in the show, but just two sentences on that is a bit of a, maybe even a teaser here. And then let's dive into that process that you have to get them there. Okay. So uh, right up from what I get people to do and advocate is just eat clean. If you simply cut out processed foods and one of the slides I'm going to show you in a little bit is, is a fair rate powerful demonstration of what happens to a human being inside their body who gives up processed foods. And uh, that will be powerful when we get to it. But getting them to, to do that will have the greatest impact in helping to eliminate chronic disease. It's basically what I did from the, the get-go when I met this uh, patient who was uh, telling me to change my diet, uh, getting that, cutting out processed food, cutting out carbs. And the second thing I did very early on, which is very unusual from other people, is I started at the same time I eliminated processed foods, I started eating these traditional fermented foods. And fermentation is how our uh, ancestors would have preserved food. And it was noted, it was kept on as tradition, not only did it extend the shelf life of food, but it actually proved the quality of that food, meaning it actually took it from one form and put it into a better form so that it did better things. Food are meant to help you. Uh, that's how we should understand food. And fermenting that food improves, significantly augments the capacity for that food to, uh, to improve you. And one insight that's really important that I'd like to make at, at that also, at this outset is all of my struggles, all those medical conditions that I was struggling with, um, I was responding to food and in my lifestyle in a way to kind of cope with and almost like treat it, and, but in, in a perverse, inverted way, you know, eating crappy food, processed food, sweet, you know, pleasurable, comfortable type of foods, 
um, and, 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 and being lazy because I, I was tired and my back hurt so much and I was so filled with, with disease that I wouldn't work out. All of that was, was in my mind being used to treat my pain, like to soothe it. It was almost like a, a Percocet or narcotic. But what, what you don't see is when you're doing it, doing it that way, you're actually pouring gasoline on the fire. You're making it worse. So that's a really key uh, concept at the outset as we, we start to look into uh, these specific things that you should be doing that you need to ask yourself, huh, am, is that what I'm doing? Is Are all my medical problems being somehow hijacked in a way that now I, I go out and, you know, I drink, I'm eating crappy processed foods, uh, I, I'm being lazy. I'm feeling basically feeling sorry for myself, and I and I respond a particular way. So very often, when when I meet with clients and I delve into their lifestyle, I see all these negative contributions that they simply had this perverse way of thinking was actually um, treating or helping them cope. It's not. It's making your situation worse. And getting that insight will allow you to to understand. Uh, how you want to live differently and live better. So I take people, I clean them up, I give them a more efficient way of eating, I, of living. I I help them to understand and save time and save effort. It's just having an intelligent approach. And by the way, all of our ancestors knew how to do this previously, and they pass it on to generation after generation. But at some point in humanity, we got screwed up and we started passing on the wrong things. Um, and a, 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 there's a point in the anthropology you can point to uh, where there is an influence in life on our species. Every member of the species, species has something called selection pressure. So selection pressure is this scientific term where is the influence on a single organism in a species to live better so they can live longer and have a better quality of life. So when you understand that and drive that if you live correctly, you get to live around longer, your survival improves, and it's also your thriving improves. You actually enjoy a better life. But today, selection pressure isn't around anymore. Basically, everybody on average lives to be about 77 years of age. Now, for the first time in the history of our species, the last three years in a row, that number is going down. It's never happened before. And people better wake up because in spite of all our medical advancements, we're living less and less for the first time in our history because so much disease is going on. So selection pressure has been changed and it's been replaced by something that I call selection pleasure. So now we just pursue comfort. We pursue pleasure and it actually makes us inversely worse. The wise man and woman who sees that can turn that around and improve their quality of life and uh, how much uh, and how long they're going to live as a result of that key insight. So that's what I do: get people to understand the necessity to 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 live better, and then I give them the specific things that we figured out by studying uh, average people, six thousand people, average Americans. We studied doing MRIs from the inside out, watching out and improve their disease. And in every one of them, every form of chronic disease that they had either got substantially better or went completely away, was completely reversed as they started doing these strategies. So the biggest problem facing humanity, Dave, if you've never thought about this or your audience, is uh, chronic disease. And it dwarfs everything else. In fact, if I think if you took every other problem and you added them up, it's they all in the aggregate combined wouldn't be as big as this problem. And yet nobody talks about it because chronic disease is the biggest problem because nothing costs us more money. Nothing do we waste more money on. Nothing decreases human productivity more. Nothing decreases employee productivity more. Nothing impairs the quality of life of humans more, and nothing even comes as close to killing as many people as chronic disease. 
and nobody's talking about it. Giants, we need your help with something. The world desperately needs more giants like you. Head over to Apple Podcasts and give this podcast a five-star rating so we can build an army of giants and go slay dragons together. No, I I do believe that there's a lot of profit in keeping people sick. Um, Okay, so a a couple of different things here on this. Uh, I want people to have incentive to make change. So we're going to get into how you go through this. I can't wait to see some of these scans where you're going to talk about. But there are a couple of things that I just want to, I want to hear. Okay. You're in the condition that you had or, and using that as kind of like a, a a symbol of other people. Okay. You, you, you start taking your advice. You're going to process foods. You do some of the other things too. And there's some exercise component to this. How long before a person can start to feel better? And how long does it take for them to say, you know what, that disease is gone in me now. Mm -hmm. So uh, very often people start feeling immediately better. But once they pay more attention, and not everybody's the same, but certain people have a capacity to detect small changes. They'll they'll figure that out very soon. Other people, uh, they they had these profound changes, but they just can't read it as well. They can't follow it as well. So it's going to take uh, take maybe weeks for months for that that person. But they're unusual. But for the average person, they start seeing improvement. In, in one to two weeks, they start noticing this, this improvement. My daughter. It, yeah, this is a great example of it. Absolutely. Okay. And all right, here, um, then, okay, listen, I have so many things that you don't, don't answer these right now, but, you know, uh, okay, that's great, but, you know, I really like strawberries or I really like dark chocolate or uh, I, I like an occasional whiskey. And you know what? The only thing that makes me feel better is uh, taking the leave every day and blah, 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 blah all the different types of things that people are going through. I want to get to some of those like particular questions that I know people are going to ask that are kind of like the things are hanging on to. Um, and, you know, I take all sorts of vitamins. Do I need to take those? But let's get into some of that at the end. And now uh, just t- give us the scrolls. What do these scans look like? What do they help yeah. us do? What is what you talk about visceral fat? What is this? All right. So we're right at the outset as I, just about to show you these scans that are right behind me. Uh, I'd like all your audience to write down what bothers you, what plays you, what form of chronic disease, medical condition do you have? Write it on a sheet of paper, put a comma underneath it, and then type the word visceral fat. Write the word visceral fat. And that's your Google search bar. That's your chat GPT search bar. And then go on and hit the search button and watch how much visceral fat plays a role in it and to say, why hasn't anyone talked to me about this? And that's the system. We'll do that on another show. But just suffice it to say, the system doesn't want you to know what's causing that problem. But we figured this out for the National Science Foundation. We purpose to reverse chronic disease. They funded us $1.2 million to study the reversal of chronic disease. And this was the biomarker, the biometric that we centered in on uh, that we noticed was absent in animals in the wild and is filled inside humans in a a direct proportional relationship to the amount of disease they have is the amount of visceral fat they have. And it's really the influence of this visceral fat and not the visceral fat itself. It's, It's the visceral fat secretes all these inflammatory molecules that are causing your body to get disease and to fall apart. It reduces your quality of life. It causes disease. It impairs your performance. It impairs your appearance. So heads up, we'll get started on that. But when you eliminate visceral fat and more directly its influence, because once it's gone, it can't influence you, then you start getting better and it just goes on for years. And as a researcher now, visceral fat going on 10 years, more than 10 years, Nothing improves a human being more, uh, in my experience, than getting rid of visceral fat. And you should try. What do you have to lose than to give it a try? And so let's get started on it. So what is visceral fat? It's this uh, fat stuff right in the middle of the ads bed. Okay, so we scan people right kind of like at the level of their belly button and the transverse plane. So a slice through their abdomen. And by the way, just a note. For people who are listening audibly, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can actually see these scans and you can see uh, Dr. Sean walking through all this. If not, he's going to describe it for those people who can't can't see it in a way that you can visualize it. Yeah. So great point. So 
uh, we're we're going to take a slice, sort of like a pizza, through the abdomen of somebody. Okay, and we're going to look at a cross section, an axial plane, transverse plane in the abdomen, or what's going on inside of somebody. We do multiple slices, but probably the one layer that we look at the most is probably right around the third lumbar body, kind of near your belly button. And uh, on an MRI scan, fat shows up as white, and muscle, organ. And bone show show up as dark. So when it comes to your abdomen, no surprise, you want to be mostly dark. You don't want to have a lot of fat in there. And when it comes to your whole body, you want to be mostly muscle, organ, and tissue, and not a lot of fat. You do want some fat, and we're going to get into four deadly bad fats, and we're going to get into two good fats, especially two, uh, at least one of them, and why you want to have those and think about your body from that standpoint. You want more good and less bad. And that's what we do. And, you know, right now, when you go to your doctor, they're just talking cholesterol. And that doesn't, doesn't improve. When you focus on cholesterol, nobody changes their life when they get cholesterol. You know, I like to say, you know, if you get, if you see, name one person in your life that you've had experience that walked up to you and said, my God, Dave, when I got my cholesterol out of control, my whole life changed. It helped me. Yeah. It doesn't happen. So there are things that you can get under control and start improving, and your whole life will change. And visceral fat is the first one. So you want to understand bad fat, and you want to understand good fat. So right here in the middle is visceral fat. All of that white stuff is this highly inflammatory fat that's spewing out damaging inflammatory molecules that like interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, resistant, basically cytokines and dipokines. It's more of a chemical influence than a mechanical. So think about it's just a toxic factory that's spewing out all the time. So for business analogy, it's like all of this loss, this shrinkage in your revenue going on that you don't know about because nobody ever showed it to you. So when you get this MRI, it exposes this enemy inside of you. It's in your wire. It's in your encampment. And the other type of fat that we'll get into, uh, I said fat shows up as white and darkest muscles. These are muscles on the side, back muscles here. But you see those white streaks in these muscles here, that's human marbling. And so literally, our muscles inside our body can become marbleized like steak. Only most people listening today think of marbleized steak as a good thing. It's not. And I don't want to delve really into another species right now, why it's so bad for cows. We're talking about our species, humans, but just suffice it to say, a muscle filled with fat is not going to move as well. It's not going to be as strong and it's not going to perform as well. So you do not want to tolerate that fat in your muscle. And the now, more fat. And by the way, just a point on this, too, because I, this is a confusion about some people. They say, well, you are what you eat. Yet, ironically, eating marbleized steak is pretty good for you. <laughs> the, 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 just a, a small note on you're not saying avoid a, a, a fatty ribeye. Uh, you're you're saying avoid making your muscles look like a fatty ribeye. Yeah, so I eat lots of animal fat, but I eat fat from an animal that's super healthy. So when it comes to to steaks, you want to be eating grass fed, grass finished, super healthy animals, wild game meat, venison, elk, uh, or bison that is not necessarily wild but pastured, uh, eating grass. And the fat on a healthy animal is super good. So, but I am actually saying you do not want to eat a marbleized ribeye with a lot of fat in the muscle. You want to eat a ribeye with a lot of egg fat, the fat around it. We're going to expose expose why, where that fat is and why it's different. So, yeah, I'm a little too. Well, this is a really good. This is a really good point because like, there's confusion. Confusion on these yeah. things. A lot of people, and, and you made a particular point, which is educating me quite a bit on this. Uh, a little disappointing on the taste because I do like the taste of that fat, but I can get past it for all the other reasons that are important. But this is good distinguishing factor here. 
um, on that. So we're going yeah. to say, yeah, was, you, I'm going to show you the relationship to dangerous fat going inside your muscle, that marbleization, why you don't want to have that. And you, sh- you don't want to be eating those cows because they're unhealthy. So visceral fat causes, uh, attributes to associated with this condition called myosteatosis, muscle fat, myomuscle steatosis fat. So that's human marbleization of that muscle. But there's that also happens in your back muscles, okay? Your recte spiny muscles are what these muscles in the back are called. You're laying on your back. This is the belly button. This is the spinal cord column. And these are the erecte spiny muscles keep your back erect. Well, Dave, what happens to a human being when that fat starts depositing all in those back muscles? What happens over a period of time is the back muscles stop performing as well. And you get to be this older person with a hunched over back because of this inflammatory changes going on, which, oh, by the way, healthcare system completely ignores, but has you buying all this medicine for cholesterol. Meanwhile, this inflammatory fat is invading your muscles to the extent that visceral fat is allowed to accumulate inside your abdomen. The same process causing visceral fat in your abdomen is causing deposition of inflammatory fat marvelization of your beautiful uh, human muscles. And the third type of fat we're going to take a look at in this uh, next next scan is really bad and dangerous. Let's look at somebody who's filled with a lot of visceral fat, okay? Lots of visceral fat, lots of fat in their muscles. Now you can see how muscles uh, are filled with all that white streak. And look at, look at all those white streaks now in those back muscles, the erecte spiny muscles. They're not going to keep that spine erect with that kind of fatty infiltration. But this is the other interesting thing is, and I'm going to give you a heads up, you may be able to, if you cannot afford to get an MRI, here's my first tip on when maybe how you can avoid doing an MRI. Look at the, what we found is an association between visceral fat, myosteatosis, human marbling, is a type of fat that's on the outside of your body. This is inside. But this fat right here, it hangs on the outside of your body. And this is called subcutaneous fat. But heads up, subcutaneous fat is made up of two types of fat. And your doctor doesn't know about this. But do you see that black line that's traveling there? This black line on this side here, this in that area, it's separating these two areas of fat into two compartments. And they're bricks and clowns difference. You know, uh, anybody who's a Bible sco- a scholar, it's like the, the sheep from the goats, okay, to separate those two types. And so uh, this is a, is a goat and this is a sheep. So this is bad stuff. That's called deep subcutaneous fat. It is in relationship, again, with visceral fat. And it's, so as visceral fat goes, gets laid down in your body, deep subcutaneous fat lays down your body and... Your superficial subcutaneous fat uh, is diminished. Superficial because it's just superficial right to that dark membrane called scarpus fascia. So why is this so bad? Just like visceral fat. It secretes those same deadly damaging molecules that go around and destroy your body. And if you use a business sound analogy, destroy your business. Okay. You can lose your business with, without being aware of what's going on. I, I lost a business that way. You know, there was the accountants weren't telling me, my bookkeeper weren't telling me certain things that were going really, really bad as the owner of the company. It was terrible. But unless you, you know the condition of your flock, you know what's going on, you'll fall apart unless you, you're aware of what's going on in your body. So where is this concentrated? Your left hands. Yeah. Deep subcutaneous fat is concentrated in your love handles. So if you've got love handles, uh, and you're a male, you got visceral fat. You shouldn't have any. You want to be lean back there. If you don't have visceral fat, you won't have those love handles. Now, interesting, women have love handles, but it's mostly this stuff here, superficial subcutaneous fat. That's your first good fat. Superficial subcutaneous fat secretes a molecule. Heads up, write this, write this one down, adiponectin. A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N. Google it. 
when you re, when you Google adiponectin or do a chat GPT search on it, say, what are the benefits of adiponectin? You're going to find all these fantastic benefits like reducing mortality, reducing disease, uh, reducing the incidence of heart attacks and strokes, reducing fatty liver. Oh, my God. And guess what? It does cholesterol medicine. Only they don't want you to know about that. So you want to have that adiponectin. You don't want to have the deep subcutaneous fat. You don't want to have visceral fat. And you don't want to have that myosteatosis. So when it comes to an MRI scan, what you want to look like is mostly oval. Let's take you back to when Dave Duran was 16. Well, actually, Dave, we could probably start with your abdomen today. I'm thinking your, your abdomen will probably be pretty, pretty oval. But the majority of your listeners... Not so much if they get to the age of 30, 40, 50, and 60. This guy is 30. His abdomen is mostly oval, and you want to be mostly dark, okay? He's mostly dark. He's mostly muscled, mostly organs. This guy, this image below, he's 32, but it's like bricks and clouds difference, goats and sheep. They're very different. This guy's mostly white. Uh, he's more of a barrel shape, and he has very little dark. So guess what? When you're filled with visceral fat, it shrinks your, your dark. It makes it go away. You start losing your muscle. Heads up. What's happening to all these 80, 90-year-olds out there? They got like no muscle. They're skin and bones because visceral fat came in and destroyed their muscularity. So unless you know that you got this enemy inside of you, it's literally causing atrophy of your muscles called sarcopenia the loss of muscle mass. You won't read too, you can read about it, but you won't get much discussion from your doctor about it because he or she has no cure for it. But as soon as there's a treatment pill option, Big Pharma, it'll be all over. But right now, they're not talking about it. But visceral fat is the cause and you want to get rid of it. So more white, you'll end up with less dark. You got more dark, you'll, you'll have less white. So it's all lifestyle uh, driven. So this guy has two conditions. He's obese and he's also sarcopenic. So people understand they got a lot of fat inside of them, but what they also don't understand is that fat is shrinking their muscles. And just imagine when you're 60, 70 years old, you're fat, you know, little teeny tiny muscles. How are you going to get up out of a chair? How are you going to get in and out of a car? How are you going to have lunch with your grandchild or your great grandchild? You're not because you've lost your health, because you haven't been watching your books and what's going on in your body. And so this is what I call K KPI and companies, uh, business leaders work with key performance indicators to optimize and track the performance and the overall health, the bottom line revenue of a company. I, I help people understand, and I call it KBI, key biological indicators. And we track that, which really matters, and nothing will improve that company, your body, more than optimizing those KBI, getting rid of that visceral fat, getting rid of that muscle fat, and getting rid of deep subcutaneous fat. This is a guy who was mostly dark, fear, little white. He's a colleague, friend in the Army National Guard with me. I'm still active duty. I'm still lieutenant colonel. And uh, he, he's very thin. He, he trains a lot of people. Now, let's look at another great MRI. This is a female. This is the healthiest abdominal MRI I've seen in a female. And I encountered this, uh, this person by, uh, on social media, on Instagram. But we'll start with their MRI. It's almost all dark and no white. So they're incredibly healthy. But let's look at this person's, uh, just coincidentally, I was doing an Instagram live with this person just today, about two hours ago. Uh, so I found her about a year ago. Her name is Carolyn Labouchere. She's got uh, 700,000 followers. Uh, very nice figure, very nice abdomen, nice healthy legs, very healthy, nice toned arm. Look at that gorgeous, healthy, thick hair. You, you don't have to be a physician to look at this lady and say, wow, uh, most guys will look at her and say she's attractive. I'm a health researcher and say, wow, she's super healthy and a very healthy face, a very pretty face. Now, she is attractive and pretty, and that's why she's got 700,000 followers. Um, but blind all of that is really because she's so healthy. Well, the reason, the interesting thing is this, 
this lady is 59 years old, 59. She's older than you are, Dave. Um, and she And what she did, she went early on. Her mom went on the Atkins diet and cut out processed foods, cut out carbohydrates, only when the rest of the world and people around, you know, start listening to government saying you got to cut out, you got to cut out fat, fat's the problem, and eat carbs. Uh, Carolyn and her family stayed off of uh, processed foods and uh, kept eating healthy fats. So she ended up with an MRI like this now and a body that, that looks like this. Now, here's the take on point. Carolyn looks this good. And performs as well as she does and has all this influence on people all over the globe. Not because she doesn't have visceral fat. It's because she never had visceral fat. She never had the influence of visceral fat destroying her body. So Carolyn got to enjoy a life of being beautiful and healthy right up to the age of 59. And she's going to have that till she's 120 because she's never going to get that visceral fat. So do not allow that visceral fat in you. And if you got it, get rid of it so you can be in the business of optimizing your body. Not just get healthy and take pills, but you want to optimize that body and recover from it. So I have a couple of different questions because what I'm trying to do is handle objections uh, that pop up in people's minds like this and curiosity they have about this. So first of all, you are saying if you aren't Carolyn and you did make the mistake of building all this bad habits, you can recover. Absolutely. That was me. I, 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 I was filled with visceral fat and I've recovered and I do quite well. Yeah, you look great. You look you look 15 years younger. Yeah, you look 50. You're 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 the uh, you're, you're actually Patrick. You look like Patrick Dempsey with light with with the, the with gray hair. Uh, and you're an actual doctor, though, not just playing one on TV. The the other thing that I was going to say here is this. So just, kind of, you know, bringing it back to my story, but not because it's my story, because it's a lot of people's story. Yeah, I I did buy the idea of eating lean. So I didn't eat a lot of carbs. I ate lean. Um, and so I could get ripped up and lean. And I was I was pretty ripped up and, and lean. But I I. I don't know that my joints didn't pay the price for that. And I'm, I'm not, I'm curious about it because I just have you know, joint issues. And of course I, I was a fighter for a long time. So there's, there's just pounding my body, but I wonder if I would have performed better for longer had I, you know, not eaten as lean as I did to be lean. So what, what is the MRI for a person who is just reducing you know, fat, particularly saturated fat to under 20 grams a day. Uh, so super high protein diet, uh, not a lot of carbs. Uh, when I used to eat that way, people would say, are you on keto? And I didn't even know what keto was. I just was eating healthy and not having cake in my mouth. But I was always eating, you know, chicken or filet mignon or lean fishes. And I feel better now uh, that I'm eating more fat. What would that scan have looked like? And what's the relationship here? Yeah. So my guess is when you went lean, um, you you probably, uh, when you cut out healthy fat, the healthy form of fat, and you didn't know what a healthy form of fat was, but it's end caps and it's not fat marbleized steak. Um, and it's, uh, uh, but it's, it's healthy sources of fat, grass fed butter, uh, um, and uh, healthy forms of uh, optimized fat and not the wrong kind of fat. So once you understand that, then you get rid of that visceral fat. And it's cutting out those carbohydrates. So we're going to show you in a scan in just a few slides coming up what the role on uh, especially processed carbohydrates cause inside the body. Very, very destructive. So let's see if we can make you uh, a little bit more of a believer about this marbleization and why you want to have a second, you know, think again about even marbleized steak. Do you want to eat the fat around the animal that's really healthy? But if a real a healthy is, animal is really healthy, it will not have that marbleization. So so to be, be clear on this, they're, they're not eating. OK, so you can eat the wrong fat from the, the, the steak, but but not eating enough fat also has a detrimental effect, though. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. I mean, the two things you must eat are protein and fat. Carbohydrates, you know, it's interesting. 
they don't even teach this really in medical school. Carbohydrates, not a single bit of carbohydrates is part of anything in your body. Everything in your body that you can touch and look at, all your beautiful organs and cells, all come from just protein and fat, nothing else. Carbohydrates are just energy. It's exogenous energy. And what I like to get people to do is to make the very best form than something that comes outside of your body. So uh, it's not an essential macronutrient. Carbohydrates are not because your body can make it. Vitamins, your body can't make, so you got you to gotta take them. Protein, your, your body can't make it. Fat, your body can't make. So you've got, you got to uh, get these things exogenously. That's why they are central macronutrients. But carbohydrates are just extra. They pour it in. And I like the idea of having my body make the perfect form of carbohydrates those, the, in its perfect form, glycogen, through gluconeogenesis. And when your body makes the perfect form, it can use it way better than an exogenous form. So um, really, when you take carbohydrates, it's a bit like riding up uh, a building in a uh, escalator or taking an elevator. You know, it's kind of a, uh, a, a way of cheating to make it easier. I make my body make it. So fat and protein is what you need. Carbohydrates you do not need. And uh, you actually optimize your life getting those uh, the, those correct forms of molecules, macronutrients in your body correctly. So I'm I'm not a, you know an anti carber. I just throw down a lot of caution about carbohydrates. Then I uh, issue um, insights into why you want to maximize your fat and your protein. But fat is hugely important. But it's again the type of fat you want healthy fat. So. Let's explore these two different adamants. Okay, this guy is filled with visceral fat. He's got a huge amount of deep subcutaneous fat, big rough handles, myosteatosis on his muscles. You can see those white streaks and those beautiful dark muscles. But this guy here below is almost all muscle. I mean, this guy uh, is the singularly most healthy abdominal MRI scan I've ever seen in my career. And he's also the healthiest human being I ever physically examined. He's an Olympic sprinter, and so these are his back muscles. This is his core. Look at this guy's core, about the same size as for people body. But this guy's backbone, his core is like five times the size of his backbone. This guy has the, the healthiest core I've ever seen. It's called the psoas muscle, and it's literally kissing his six-pack, wall-to-wall muscle. Now, look at this guy's uh, core right here. Uh, basically wall-to-wall inflammatory disease causing fat. So bricks and clouds difference between these two. Again, lots of white, very little dark, so shrinking his muscles. Very little white and huge amount of dark because his muscles are preserved and they actually can, he can produce muscle protein synthesis way better. He can make muscle way better than this guy because his visceral fat is that little bit here. This is actually retroperitoneal fat. It's actually very good. This is the fat that Native Americans would eat on a bison. The first tissue they would eat was they go for this particular fat. So that's a good fat that you want to eat. Don't want to be eating this fat here, uh, the mild stib marbleized meat, and uh, don't want to be eating the deep subcutaneous fat uh, that, uh, uh, on this particular creature. But let's move over to looking at the legs. We scan people's legs when we scan their abdomen. Always associated with visceral fat is muscle fat. You can't have a lot of visceral fat and have lean muscles. So you got visceral fat, you're going to have screwed up, diseased muscles. These are the legs. These are the fingers in those legs. Inside the bone is bone marrow, and that's why it shows up white. But look at all that. It looks like uh, spider webs, all that fatty infiltration. What does it really look like? Wagyu beef. Wagyu beef. It looks like human. It's Wagyu human flesh is what I call it. This guy's legs, look how how he has none of that. He has nice dark muscles. It's, it's a little bit lighter here, but it's 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 just because the contrast is is a, is a little bit uh, is up on this thing, but he has no none of these white streaks. He is pure. It's like filet mignon 
tenderloin. So the, the, the smaller amount of your visceral fat, the more lean and better performing your muscles. By the way, this is one of the 10 fastest men in the world. He's an Olympic sprinter. So let's look at those stakes and go back and try to rethink again what's happening uh, from a dietary standpoint. This is a cow fed a lot of carbohydrates, a non-specific uh, species-appropriate diet. Cows eat grass. We should all know that. But this cow is only fed grass and grass finish and grass fed. And so it's very lean, does not have myosteatosis. It's got in chap fat. That stuff is awesome. I would scavenge that body to eat the healthy fat, you know, on this animal. But the bad fat ain't there. Because this cow lived the way it should, out in the field, rolling around in the sunshine, uh, mating and having, you know, fun in the sun and eating what it was supposed to, grass, and not fed uh, a man-made diet to produce profit. It, it literally, when you feed these carbohydrates, increases the revenue of that cow when it steps on the scale. It earns more money for the owner of that cow, that steer or whatever piece of beef, cattle go to, you know, ranchers growing because of all that disease. So corn, soy, uh, grains, uh, these, they, it looks like Wagyu beef. Wagyu beef, you know, those cows can't even reproduce. They're so diseased because they're concentrating on all this disease. They become infertile. They can't, uh, the babies die when they're born. So now they take the embryos and put them in other other cows, and then they take that baby Wagyu um, bred cow and sell it. You know, this is insane. And the consumer has no idea. They think Wagyu beef and this marbleized beef is, is is healthy. And they found out they cut off the horns from these animals that they get even more of this. It's crazy. You know, so now they're cutting off, you know, making these animals more diseased and they pen them up and they're not out and walking around the field. So you do not want to look like this. And by the way, Cattle feed truck turned over recently, Dave, uh, on a highway, and it was pictures were on the internet, and you can search for it. In the middle of the cattle feed were all these bright little colors, you know, red, blue, purple, yellow, green. And you know what was? Skittles. Mm. They're feeding cattle in their grain Skittles to get this. Wow. Any of you guys feeding your kids candy? I would imagine there's a lot out there. Yeah. So, wow. So a, a, a little question here. Um, uh, and, ju- and just by the way, 30 seconds on this because I don't think it's that important, but you hear about skinny fat now. People that don't really appear to be fat, but uh, there's nothing to their muscles. I, I, there's a military recruiter that talks about how these young guys are coming in and they uh, they, they look fine in skinny jeans, but their, their muscle development is so bad that they're breaking bones in basic workouts and they've got to supplement them. Uh, is this a real thing? Yeah, so skinny fat is this MRI right here. So they're they're thin on the outside and fat on the inside. So they're skinny. This person has a 31-inch waist. So they're skinny, but they're mostly fat. And so it's an invisible obesity that you just do not know. Visceral fat is the defining feature of a skinny fat person. So what's the relationship between exercise and all this? Let's see. You ate perfectly, like you you talk about, but a person is sedentary. What what effect does that have? Like, I don't know. Is, is it possible to use this language? Hey, sixty percent of this is eating right, and forty percent is fitness. Or is there is there a way to do that? Well, I'll I'll, I'll throw it throw it around and say it's it's difficult to do, but I will say uh, without a doubt, it's more about what you eat. Than how you exercise. So let me let me share with you why. Okay. And this series of scans, it's the same person. We scan them six times over the course of 35 weeks. They're a 68-year-old CEO of a company, uh, owner of a company. I call him a curmudgeon because he he wouldn't do what we wanted to do for the National Science Foundation. But I'm so glad that he was a curmudgeon because he gave us a really cool insight in a science that we never would have done without him being stubborn. So uh, what he did was he would not would not follow our recommendations. So we came up with like how to exercise and how to live. He simply 
uh, would only cut out processed foods, cut out carbohydrates. So he cut out carbohydrates. He ate meat and uh, fat and uh, meat and vegetables. And so this was his first scan. And you could see right up here a huge amount of visceral fat that he has there and a large amount of fat in his muscle, that human marble. And from here to here, it's only two weeks. And Dave Duran has probably never even seen a dental MRI scan. I know you, I don't think you've been to medical school yet, but it's already calculated in his sharp mind that red is less. Mm-hmm. He has less visceral fat in two weeks just from cutting out those carbohydrates. And so when he eliminated those processed foods, especially processed carbohydrates, he reduced his visceral fat in a very short period of time. But over the course of the, the series of those scans, uh, after 35 weeks, he went from having a dad bod, big barrel belly, to having a body like a collegiate athlete, like he was a swimmer in his 20s. And the only thing he did, Dave, was he cut out those processed carbohydrates. So he did not exercise one minute. Now, this scan astounded me because I was a big time exerciser and I, I had assumed that exercise is really important. Now, to be sure, it is really important, but it's not as important as getting control of your diet and what goes into your most important physical asset is your body. And so you really want to fuel it with appropriate fuel. Nothing should be going into your most important physical asset. I happen to feel my soul is my most important asset, but my physical asset that I can touch is my body. So I really care and I get my clients to care about that physicality, their their asset, not put in bad fuel. So uh, this nicely exemplifies the power of um, getting dietary control. But to your point, you know, we can look, we did scans, and that's the thing I like about MRIs. We did N of one, meaning the study was just one person, and we followed what exactly was going on when they do that. And that's what I continue to do with my clients. I, I don't really care what's going on in 7.9 billion people if we even could study all of them. What I want to, you to understand is we're just going to study you and get rid of this dangerous fact and see what works best for you. So let's... um Let's take a look now at what happens. Oh, by the way, uh, another scan um, that that could, another type of fat, the four type of bad fat, is organ fat. So this is the right lung, the left lung. So it's scan in the chest, and in the middle of the lung in your chest is your heart. So this is your heart. But this curmudgeon, the guy, the sixty-eight year old, they wouldn't exercise. He had this big, huge uh, chunk of fat highly inflammatory fat around his heart. And then at 13 weeks, Steve, look how much he reduced it by eliminating those processed carbohydrates, eliminating the processed food. So an enormous um, reversal of that dangerous fat around his heart. So it, it exemplifies, again, why you want to get control of your diet. But to answer your question about what role does exercise play, well, it actually plays a hugely important role. So this scan probably more than any other uh, exemplifies this. So here's a guy. He's 58 years old. He is a CEO of a company. And he's filled with this visceral fat. You see all that white inside of him. And this is his second scan. So it's a follow-up scan. And it's unchanged. He didn't get any better. And we gave him protocol, and he wasn't a curmudgeon. He would do what we told him to do. And so we're trying to figure out why did he get better. So I asked him about a few things, and this is where it's helpful for your audience. So what else causes visceral fat besides processed foods and processed carbohydrates? Well, what another one is alcohol. Are you drinking alcohol? So to the extent that you're consuming alcohol, you will cause deposition of visceral fat. That's not to say you can't drink any alcohol. It's just there's a direct relationship to alcohol. So the more you drink, the more visceral fat uh, you'll have. And the harder, the the interesting thing is, it becomes to get rid of that visceral fat when you start doing things like cutting out carbohydrates and exercising uh, appropriately. And this is what the purpose of the scan is to show the appropriate exercise. So hang with me. So 
He wasn't drinking alcohol. I said, nope, not drinking alcohol. I said, well, what about sleep? Because sleep is hugely important. It causes visceral fat if you have disrupted sleep. And it makes the elimination, again, of visceral fat very difficult. So if you're not sleeping correctly, you're going to impair your body through visceral fat, either not being able to, either by causing it or not being able to eliminating it. But he assured me, nope, I'm sleeping great. The third thing, you know, uh, third thing is stress. You know, are you stressed out? What is the primary shareholder's attitude about you? Is the primary shareholder going to fire you? Are they unhappy with your performance as CEO of this company? Uh, are you stressed out? Your wife uh, has got some, um, is, is going to leave you or you're having fights at home or your kid just got uh, arrested with drugs or shoplifting or something. Do you have stress in your life? He said, no, no stress. Everything's going great. Company's doing great. Family life, no problems, no stress. So the fourth thing we asked him about was distance running. Are you doing any exertional, long durational exercise? Because what we saw for the National Science Foundation is people that did a lot of running or a lot of bicycling, cyclists with, uh, you know, running, doing these 100 mile bike rides and stuff, um, they were filled with visceral fat when we would scan them. Now, it's not entirely clear why that is the case, but they have higher levels of visceral fat. And the interesting thing that we saw is when they continue to do it, it makes it really hard to get rid of that visceral fat. It's hard to eliminate that visceral fat. So this guy, when we asked about durational exercise, he says, yeah, I'm still running. And we said, well, we asked you to give up your distance running. He was running 10 miles a day, five days a week. So that he was not really a casual jogger. Um, he was a, he was doing a lot, a lot of distance running. And so we gave him uh, direction to basically threaten him, said either you stop running uh, or we're going to kick you out. No more free scans and no more appointments with free doctors to optimize your health for the National Science Foundation. So he agreed. He stopped running and he started to do what we told him to do, sprint. So he goes from cutting out, doing 10 miles a day, five days a week running, to only sprinting six 10 to 20 second sprints every other day. So six very brief sprints um, every other day. And then look what happened to him. Yeah, all this visceral fat in less than two months was eliminated by just changing how he exercised. He abandoned durational exercise for maximal intensity exercise. So I don't even advocate now high-intensity exercise. I say maximum intensity exercise, and uh, which is by definition of, you know, when you sprint, you run maximally as fast as you can. If you're not running as fast as you can, it's just fast running. But if it's not sprinting. So, okay, so, you know, here you've got a guy who, me, who would have been incredibly interested in this before I felt the need to replace my hip. And now I'm saying... I don't know. Uh, how, how do I get to a place where I sprint? Yeah. Can I, can I, I, I get yeah. it all the time because people say, I've got screwed up knees. I got screwed up hips. Um, I got bad eagles, different things. Well, here's what we found after working with people. We don't get them sprinting on day one. We get them eliminating their visceral fat. And when they get rid of their visceral fat, they stop the inflammation and their body does something for the first time. It starts recovery. And that's what's happened to you, Dave, is what's happening to your daughter, which she texted you about an hour ago by yeah. cutting out that processed foods. Her body is starting to eliminate that visceral fat. And now, without burdened by all that inflammation, her body does what it naturally wants to do. And yours too, and all my clients do the same thing. They start recovering. So that degenerative joint disease starts reversing. And so ultimately, the majority of my clients who work with me go on to eventually being able to sprint. And one of the problems with distance running is, is the constant repetitive uh, slow forces over a period of time are far more destructive on the hip and the knee than the more significant forces that you get uh, on your knee. And one possible explanation for that is, 
your foot, if you can pretend uh, that my hand here is my foot, when you spring it, you lay it on your forefoot and this becomes your shock absorber, okay? And boom, it lands and your foot is absorbing the shock. But when you jog, your heel striking and those forces go right up your keel calcaneus into your tib and fib bones and into your femurs and get transferred all of that force without the beautiful uh, adapted uh, shock absorber that comes with your foot. So it's really how you perform, how you're doing that running also plays a role. So uh, once clients become more healthy, they learn to sprint, their stride changes, uh, they're eventually able to to get into sprinting. We start them slow. So I tell people, they ask me that question, you know, um, what, I, want, I can't start sprinting right away. Health optimization is a journey for life. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just optimizing your health uh, for the rest of your life. And it's not a light switch. It's not something you, you immediately get to, except for the decision to start optimizing. You just got to get that insight. So this guy, you... So when you hear things like, okay, you have osteoarthritis, you're doomed. You can't do any of this. This cannot be healed. It cannot reverse. You are, uh, you're, it's, a, it's a ticking time bomb before you have to have this replaced. This is not true. Not true. It's not true. Now, it's, it's true in the experience of those physicians because they've never seen, they don't know about visceral fat. They don't know what's causing. But if you eliminate the underlying cause and the body starts correcting itself, no way, Jose, does the body correct itself when it's filled with all the inflammatory fat. And, you know, if these pills really work, then why do you ever have to refill your prescription? Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so here's another question. So a guy like me, uh, you know, uh, you eliminate, uh, and I enjoy a little whiskey here and there, you know, you eliminate all of the whiskey, you you eliminate the carbs that's already been done, and really the whiskey is maybe you know, one or two on a weekend. I don't know if that has a detrimental effect or not. Um, then you have, uh, you know, uh, the carb, carb issues, exercise. I mean, is it the type of thing where it's like, okay, well, why don't you just <clears throat> sprint for five seconds, three times every three days and just see how that feels. So you start someplace like that. Yeah. Is that, that makes sense. Yeah, you can start that way. Some people, Dave, I actually just get them spray cycling. I get them on a stationary bike. I have them dial up the resistance, and uh, I get them to exercise uh, on a stationary bike, which can be less impactful on the joints and easier to do. And get them, you know, uh, with uh, some workouts just on a stationary bike or sprint swimming, going into a pool. And okay. doing a sprint, you know, it's like no impact on your joints then. And just sprinting in a in a pool, you know, as though you're you're racing for the uh, a fifty meter freestyle, you know, event in the Olympics, or you're trying to swim away from a a shark or something to save your life. So there are alternate uh, ways of exercise in a maximal uh, intensive way, but it's uh it's it's this if you look at animals in the wild. They don't jog. They don't. Uh, they don't do chronic exercise. They're not out uh, going to gyms for long periods of time. They have basically very brief, violent encounters with prey, predator, where they have challenges between each other uh, that's going on. Uh, and that and that form in nature is something that we studied when we purposed to reverse chronic disease and get rid of visceral fat. We saw that in the wild, and so we started to get people to. Uh, to, to to sprint because that's what animals do. Sprint to get away from danger or sprint to catch prey, and uh, and then they have this uh, violent physical encounter. Now, I don't recommend to my clients to go out and get in fights, but a lot of my clients do BJJ and you know other types of forms of uh, exercise. But you can also kind of emulate fighting um, in the manner in which you lift weights. So just increase the intensity, you know, the amount of weight. Uh, don't get injured. First rule of medicine is do no harm. But uh, I, you know, I came from a background in law enforcement and uh, I've been in many fights in law enforcement, basically bad men and women don't want to go to jail. So there's fiscal altercations and there's a bunch of bunch of people in blue suits show up and eventually end up with steel bracelets in the back end of a police car. 
But once I had a fight for my life where I thought I almost died, it was just me and a bad guy. And uh, I never had a fight like that in my life. And it lasted about three minutes. And I could hear lots of sirens. People call for for called for help. The police officer fighting for his life. Um, and uh, but that was very different than any other fight I ever had. And so I realized the intensity of that is what, the way animals in the wild, you know, basically have that pretty often. So now when I lecture to law enforcement about health optimization and exercise, I get them to train for that type of fight because that's the one that's going to kill them. Um, that they really need to win is that maximum intensive fight and not something. Even MMA, you know, a lot of those those fights go on for for a while, and you know, they, you, no, MMA wouldn't be as popular today if it was done in ten seconds. You know, mm-hmm. there's no money. Nobody wants to be tuned in and paying for a ten second fight. So, um, you know, you you really want to have that very very maximally intensive form of exercise, uh, and and you can get that in just. 30, 30 seconds sprinting is unbelievably taxing on your body. And so yeah. uh, that's what I get people doing, you know, working out very, very maximally in a short period of time and eliminates this visceral fat and it produces more myokines. I mean, the, the biological explanation for why maximum intensity exercise works better than lower intensity exercise is, is answered by myokines, these messaging molecules, and they're produced in proportion to the intensity of that exercise. And so not as many myotines are produced in, in like lower intensity exercise, like jogging and cycling. Now, I know you get a lot of comments. People are like, why? Cycle so very intensely, go up a hill. Okay, yeah, during that time period, you will. But it's the rest of the time, it's a lower intensity exercise compared to a 10-second sprint that Usain Bull or Fred Curley, today's world's fastest man, produces in 10 seconds, they cross that finish line and they will die if they do not recover their physiology because they've worked so hard. They're going to blow off all that CO2. That's a level of intensity that, that people just are not getting in a 100 mile bike ride or 21 sure. mile, uh, jog and marathons. So uh, there's a vast difference in those myokines. And an interesting observation is. Muscle protein said this is the creation of muscle happens from exercising these myokines. And myokines build muscle and burn fat. Well, if you look at a professional cyclist, well, back up, bodybuilders say never skip a weight a leg day, right? Because those legs are so key, they help you build arm muscle. Actually, studies show if you squat and never lift with your arms, your arms still get bigger. Because of those myokines, those messaging molecules travel and tell your biceps and triceps to get bigger. But um, that only really happens because of the squatting maximum, that very heavy lifting that you do in a short period of time in those large muscles. Well, interesting, if you ever examine a professional cyclist like I have as a physician, they have big muscles on their legs. And if they are producing all these myokines, you think they have big arms, but they got the scrawniest arms that would terrify, uh, discourage a grandma. I mean, these these arm muscles are just pathetic in these cyclists. So they're not getting myokines going uh, and telling them to produce chest muscles and lats and and arm arm muscles and stuff. So you you want to exercise in an appropriate manner. So the two things, in my opinion, as a health and performance optimized physician that I get my clients to work with is sprinting how well they, how fast they can sprint and how well they could fight. Basically that, that maximum intensity of exercise. Those two things um, have to do more and have done more to keep people in the gene pool and improve the quality of life of our, of our species, Homo sapiens, more than any other forms of exercise. Well, okay, so this is just so useful. I, we, I, I'm gonna, I have a couple other questions for you and I'm gonna have to just bring you on another time. Um, I'm just thinking from the audience perspective. Okay. But I really love strawberries and blueberries. Can I have them? Yeah. Well, you can have anything you want. The question is, uh, to what extent you want to allow them and are there better forms of food that you should be eating? So when I work with a client, I help them understand that they want to be maximizing, you know, fat and protein and these other forms. Uh, of uh, of uh, macronutrients, carbohydrates, and fruit, and things like that. They can they can eat them, but the more of those you eat, 
uh, more things you compromise on, uh, the less room you have to allow awesomeness in. So, you know, I try to get people stop paying attention to rules. Everybody's like, oh, God, I need a rule. I can't do that. Well, you just look at your life. There's all these decisions I call them stacking. So don't make your decision about being healthy based on one thing. There are many, many things that you got to do. And so people that, you know, are, are asking me, can I eat strawberries? Sure, you can eat strawberries. Do you want to eat, you know, nothing but strawberries? No, you don't want to eat nothing but strawberry, strawberries. But as you get more healthy, your body starts telling you what you uh, need to eat more of and how to guide you. But when you're in a disease state, it's it's the signals and understanding about that are not as good. So just be careful about making decisions about what you eat. Eat things as clean as possible initially is what I get people started doing. And then uh, ultimately, um, their their diets become more optimized for them and their situation. So one other direct question, uh, dark chocolate, 90%. There's almost no sugar in it. Is that okay to eat? Well, it, the other 10% is going to be problematic. Um, a better form of dark chocolate that I prefer people to eat is 100% um, dark chocolate. And uh, and in non-processed form or the least processed form I knew of is cacao nibs, cacao c a c a o n i b s. So it's basically just a uh, cracked, crunched up, uh, dried form of uh, cocoa p- pods that have been fermented, and that's the basis from which uh, is provides the chief ingredient for chocolate. So it's least processed and it's a healthier form of uh, chocolate to eat. And it's also interesting to me that it's crunchy. It's sort of like those that cereal grape nuts that people, mm-hmm. you know, eat the crunchy and people like the crunch. So you you don't get really get a crunch in a in a chocolate bar, but with cacao nibs, you do. And you don't get all the other processed uh foods and food preservatives and alkali and other things that come in with that. So I just work with people to help them understand. Now, some people just aren't ready for cacao nips. You know, they mm-hmm. they think it's too dark and they need a little bit of sugar. Well, I work with them. You know, I mm-hmm. work with those people. You know, I work with people that are Hindus um, from India that I do not like, you know, how they eat. But they're, they want to become the best version of the South. So if that's all they want to eat are vegetables um, because they have a, a philosophy, a lifestyle, I work with them, I at least show them MRIs, and I get them eating fermented food. So, and they're lows in visceral fat. They, they're getting better. You know, a lot of my- you have, a, you have a very practical approach here. You don't, you, you don't have this like, uh, 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 eliminate every, well, you eliminate processed food, but, you know, eliminate, you know, every amount of joy in your life. You know, you're not like, if you have one strawberry, you're going to die. But you're like, listen, you have to make sure you balance this out. And if you- there is a point of diminishing return. We have too many of these. It's not going to work for you. Yeah. I think that's, that's smart. Okay. One last question before uh, we, we transition to another topic here. And that is uh, the only thing that helps is if I take in a leave or ibuprofen. Uh, how I, is this, is this program you're putting me on doctor going to help me so quickly that I can somehow bridge the gap of not experiencing pain and stop taking this? And are these things bad for you? Yeah. So I think they are bad. Um, I work with clients to get them off of those things. But again, I'm not dogmatic about it. And I'm like, listen, unless you agree to stop taking these things, you're not going to work with me. It's not about me. It's about you. I work with people to help them optimize. And so everybody's in a little different place. But one alternative, if you're somebody like, gosh, you know, I feel like maybe I should give these things up. And But is there something else I could do? One thing you could try doing, and if you're taking the leave, maybe start doing these other things that I'm about to tell you about, and maybe you'll be able to stop taking the leave. So a leave use um, COX-2 inhibitory pathway. It's a pharmacologic target uh, that NSAIDs, non-steroidals like Aleve, Ibuprofen, Motrin, R, um, they go after and they inhibit that particular pathway. Well, that pathway is borrowed from nature, and you can get it in a more natural form, by simply taking some supplements like turmeric, ginger, uh, anti-inflammatories like berberine and cacao, you know, those cacao nids and uh, fish oil has anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So that's what I, I get people to consider doing to get off of uh, the NSAIDs, the more synthetic form of those natural anti-inflammatory substances 
But I think, you know, vegetables and, and a lot of plants have these profound medicinal values. Um, I don't I think you got to be careful. You don't want to take too much like you don't want to take too much medicine. Although big pharma seems to think that that's perfectly fine. Take all the medicine you want. The, the, mm. the least they're hoping that even if they don't come out and say that. But uh, turmeric, ginger, fish oil, cacao, berberine, some of these uh, uh, N-acetylcysteine, that, uh, they're anti-inflammatory. And uh, they provide a, in my opinion, a better source of uh, treating pain and inflammation for people uh, to consider doing. And uh, and that that's what I'd recommend because the NSAIDs are pro-inflammatory in certain regards. They actually perturb the delicate epithelial cells inside your gastrointestinal tract. And so that's why they tell you to take it with food. And they're also damaging to the endothelial cells. If you just Google right now, Motrin comma heart attack, hyperprofen comma heart attack, you'll see that it's associated with increasing the incidence of myocardial infarction. It actually, uh, but it's 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 not well known and it's not promoted very much, but you'd be way better off um, eating these more natural forms, which are not pro-inflammatory to your epithelial cells and your delicate cells that line your arteries and your veins called your endothelial cells. So, so you, you know, clearly you advocate eating things that would not be friendly to the carnivore diet. Uh, so the carnivore diet has a lot of really good things about it, but might fall a little bit short. Is that what you're Yeah. So here's my take on the carnivore diet. Um, and I am mostly carnivore, uh, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, the people are getting these dramatic. Listen, you cannot deny these incredible benefits People are immediately getting from going to the carnivore diet. And I think a lot of it is best explained by, um, yeah, meat is, is a really good, safe source. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, that, that we don't understand all the vegetables and processed foods and all these other things that are coming into our body and causing us uh, inflammation. So the carnivore diet, if you ate nothing but meat, is is the, the, the fastest way of eliminating, we saw in studies, Visceral fat, heart fat, myosteatosis, with one exception. When you eat meat, and the other thing you take in is fermented foods. So if you take vegetables, but only if they're fermented, you take fruit, and only if it's fermented to reduce those carbohydrates. And these kind of toxic molecules called lectins, a big common uh, lectin people have heard about is gluten. So we're learning more and more about these lectins and oxalates and, and saponins and these other molecules these plants have that are problematic for, you know, a species. So um, I think carnivore diet is fantastic. I like carnivore diet with ferments, uh, but I like people that are eating Tito. Listen, Tito is way better than the standard American diet. Paleo, eating low carb, uh, eating a Mediterranean diet. Uh, incorporating fermented foods into these things. You can't be dogmatic, but what I tell people is whatever diet you want to do, let's study it and then let's tweak it. Let's see what's mm-hmm. going on inside Dave Duran's admin, looking at this heart fat. And if you got it, it's time to make a change. And then I talked about changes as said, let's study the change. Let's see what gets, makes your muscle more lean. It gets rid of those fatty infiltrates. What gets rid of that visceral fat and when we take that kind of approach, people are okay with it. They 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 don't mind making a change. But if you're if you you don't follow what's going on inside, uh, you may not know to change your diet and change your lifestyle. But it's way more than just diet. You know, it's it's how you exercise, how you spread some of these other things that I talked about. Doing a sauna, you know, has has fantastic benefits. So, you know, I I tell people they can afford to get MRIs uh, to do them and see what's going on and. And stop trying to put money in other things like your boat and your yacht and your house and, and your company and your portfolio. Invest your best ROI that you can possibly make and get the best return on is investing in your, your most important physical asset, which is your body. And if you get your body more healthy, then you're going to perform better as a business professional, a per- professional performer, whatever it is that you do. Uh, when you biologically optimize, you're going to do it better and you're going to be a better leader, a better influencer, 
you know, if you work with consultants, they're going to pay more attention to you. If you head up a company, your your employees are going to look up at you and say, man, I want to follow that. And particularly model the change, show that you're improving. You know, imagine at wherever you're at that you could still optimize. I'm 60, about to turn 61. And I, I imagine how much better I'm going to be in five years. So I'm going to look better. I'm going to be performing better. And by the way, as we study these protocols, we see no end in sight. As you mm-hmm. focus in on these things, people just keep keep getting better. I've, you know, until last year, I lost my oldest client. He was 84 in a car wreck. And that guy was just continuing to improve. He'd come over and spring with me at the age of 84. It was wow. super exciting to see how much he was getting better. So it's just six. imagine how you can keep improving. Yeah, I mean, that, that whole idea. I used to joke with my kids. They're all adults out of the house. And I can remember that point when they'd start beating me in races and stuff like that. And I would just, I'd have to uh, amp up my smack talk game because my physical game went down. But I'd always tell them that I'm not going to, I'm probably going to peak. I'm probably going to peak when I'm about 75 and then slowly go down over 30 years. Now I actually think that might be a real thing. I can go for another hour or two hours or three hours. In fact, I'm going to come visit you. I'm going to get these scans done. I'm going to spend five hours with you on how I can make these improvements. And I'll probably come back and let the audience know and know how that goes already knowing that I I have benefited by some of these things as well already. So you've been a fantastic guest. I am really thrilled to have you here. And uh, I just want to let everybody know, I really encourage you to dive in and take a look. How can people get a hold of you? Where they, where, where's the best to get the information that you, you can share? Yeah. So I'm on uh, LinkedIn uh, at Dr. Sean O'Mara, D-R-S-E-A-N-O-M-A-R-A. Uh, I use the same um, screen name for Instagram, for X, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and uh, uh, and now even TikTok. I'll do whatever I can uh, to try to re- reach people with this important message. And I also have a website, just my name, www.drseanomara.com. So people can follow me and, and get my content. Um, I have, I put a lot of uh, these tips that we discussed today, Dave, on my I'm pinned on my social media account so people can can get that in detail and uh, track it and follow it. And uh, anybody's really motivated and uh, wants to optimize as quickly as possible, they can they can find out information on how to work with me. Yeah, and we'll put some links below too. And like I always say, um, I'm especially saying it this way. If you do what the doctor says, you can be a giant and we can go slay some dragons together. Hey there, giant. Thanks for watching Durand On Demand. I need your help with something. The world desperately needs more giants. You know it and I know it. We've been around a lot of people struggling, figuring out how to make things go. So hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, share this with as many people as you can. We're going to build this audience. We're going to help people slay dragons together.